them over time. OK, well, Brandon, we do have a, a couple more questions in the um, the question box, but I think we need to, um, you know, honor Phil's time and move on. So, um, Jamie, we will will follow up and try and put Brandon's answer in the question box so people can see it. So, Brandon, thank you so much. And I think, Amber, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, I will just, uh, this is here, I'll quickly take another minute of Phil's time to, to remind you about this form, but there are a couple of things um, to add. You know, we, we've had a lot of people mentioning the um, bathymetric gap analysis shown on the, the left. Brandon just did a number, uh, Georgie did earlier, Nicole yesterday, uh, a number of people have. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, that this, uh, this analysis represents what is at NCEI in Boulder and at uh, Digital Coast. So the Bathy LiDAR is incorporated. I think that was a question earlier. So just to, um, to confirm that. And then the other thing for this audience is that um, while the, uh, the analysis includes all of the Great Lakes, um, that statistic of 5% reflects um, just reflects what's been mapped in the US portion. So uh, while we can show the, the Canadian part, it, this just reflects the, the US piece and not um, that statistic isn't characterizing the whole set of Great Lakes. So Canada's information would be in, in addition to that. So again, the form, um, please think about what data uh, you have that you could share that could um, go to NCEI or Digital Coast and, and help us improve our numbers. Uh, the Great Lakes are very much a part of the National Ocean Mapping Exploration and Characterization Strategy and um, part of our goal and uh, goals and metrics there for mapping the US EEZ. So uh, one more time, <laughs> we just wanted to emphasize this and let's move on to Phil Hartmeyer to uh, talk to us about some Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary work. And Phil, I'm sorry to eat into your time. Hey, that's totally okay. I was actually uh, excited to hear more questions uh, for Brandon. It's a great presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for the quick shout out. Uh, my name is Phil Hartmeyer. For those who don't know me, I'm contracted to Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary by Cardinal Point Captains. Um, here since uh, 2014, um, serving as a maritime archaeologist here uh, and the site's unit diving supervisor for the sanctuary. Um, so the presentation this afternoon is uh, going to take us on kind of a little tour as, uh, as sanctuarians like to do, um, but focusing on, uh, on a pretty unique project area. Um, one that we haven't um, shared much about in, in presentations like Lake Bed 2030s in the past, um, and that is uh, ongoing surveys of restricted area R42007 uh, overwater range in northern Lake Huron. Uh, next slide, please. And I hope everybody uh, that's listening can uh, probably be able to give uh, some of these slides themselves at this point. Um, but it really is important to uh, to remind ourselves that, of course, within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, um, we're 15 sites, 15 sanctuaries, uh, two national marine monuments. Um, you know, and these sites represent some of the planet's most you know treasured underwater places in the United States and, and territories. Um, of course. Sanctuaries specialize in different research, education, and outreach initiatives. Um, but in the end, uh, all strive to connect people to the water and to the resources that lay beneath the waves. Um, you know, uh, Thunder Bay no longer has the title of the only sanctuary in the Great Lakes, which is uh, certainly something that we were proud of for a while, but even prouder uh, to be joined by uh, sister sites at Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast and uh, ongoing efforts in, uh, in Erie, Superior, and uh, in Lake Ontario. Of course, uh, next slide, please. And within um, within sanctuary boundaries, um, you know the the, the site is co-managed. An important distinction, co-managed by the state of Michigan, um, in addition to uh, the federal funding, federal structure at Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, you know, in this corner of the Great Lakes is is known as Shipwreck Alley for for good reason. Um, due to the tens of thousands of, of vessels that have passed these shores, making their way, you know, north to Superior, over to Lake Michigan, or downbound to the lower lakes. 
And uh, it really is the crossroads where 104 wreck sites have been found. Of course, another 100 are yet to be discovered. Um, and while you know, cultural resource discovery has been a lot of the bread and butter of the sanctuary's early course management directives, um, you know, this is of course expanding as you know the sanctuary gets more fluent um, in, in in marine remote sensing and technologies, uh, both acquired and in partner projects. Um, you know, evolving into supporting efforts like Brandon was saying with uh, benthic habitat mapping and others. So lots of great things are happening now, but certainly the nexus um, for the sanctuary was uh, historic submerged cultural resources. Um, and of course, the stories of these resources pervade local, regional, national maritime heritage contexts and uh, are some of the most well-preserved shipwrecks on the planet, thanks to the cold, icy waters of Lake Huron. Of course, the original boundaries, uh, right, 448 square miles. This is going to be important here uh, in a little bit. Um, 448 square miles that framed Thunder Bay proper. And of course, in 2014, um, NOAA responded to community support um, for expanding the sanctuary to include neighboring communities and, uh, and a tenfold increase in bottomland. Now, the new boundaries were drawn to the international line that we see here and comprised 4,300 square miles. The program at Sanctuaries and the Department of Defense welcomed the inclusion of this uh, really incredible space um, called the R4207 Overwater Range to Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We'll get into the specifics of the range, of course, in a little bit, but for a brief history of, uh, of the range itself. Next slide, please. Officials at uh, Alpena's Combat Readiness Training Center. This is a, a joint air base managed by the United States um, Air National Guard, um, United States Air Force. Um, they can manage, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that manage the range can trace the origins of this overwater place, this overwater restricted airspace back to um, the Korean War era when, um, you know, F-51 Mustangs, F-84 Thunder Jets, an F-86 Sabres flew sorties from Detroit Wayne uh, Metro Airport, now known as Detroit Metro, um, Kellogg Air National Guard Base in Battle Creek. Of course, a decade later, um, B-52 Stratofortresses were flying sorties from Wordsmith Air Force Base out of Oscoda, um, and K.I. Sawyer um, out of Marquette carried the range's combat training tradition forward another 30 years. Today, the overwater range remains an excellent venue for air combat training in the Great Lakes in the Midwest. Um, I have to preface this by saying this is, this is um, you know, verbiage and of course text and information given to us by um, the Air National Guard. Um, you know, we're just sort of providing us a sort of historical context of the special place that, that happens to be within Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And the, the remoteness of, uh, of the range, you know, uh, at its closest is, you know, a rough 35, 38 um, nautical miles from Alpena, from the Thunder Bay River. The remoteness from shore and uh, the shared border with Canada make for infrequent visits from civilian vessels, which is an important quality um, when gauging suitability for a training range. And of course, in addition to the, the military activity, commercial freighters, uh, moving cargo uh, generally on two shipping lanes through a portion of the range, but partners at Coast Guard play a critical role in scheduling and separating commercial traffic um, and mili military aircraft training. Coast Guard works closely with CRTC officials to maintain safe navigation, um, commercial access and defense readiness um, all together right in the middle of Lake Huron. So lots going on here. Um, today the range is uh, 1,347 square miles but really only a small, small northern portion of that dedicated area is currently used for training exercises that occur a few times a year. These training exercises involve um, uh, Air National Guard units from, from around the country. Um, oftentimes these are international partners um, coming to cross train in the northern, uh, northern boundaries and, and taking, advantage of, um, taking advantage of this really incredible overwater range where there's just not many airspaces like it. Um, certainly not in the United States. Um, CRTC and, and Alpena, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have seen photos similar uh, to the bottom right here. Um, A10C 
a warthog uh, making headlines for Alpina as uh, you know one of the first, if not the first, um, the training exercises where they're landing on uh, on public roadways. That was a couple of miles from my house, uh, right outside uh, the CRTC. So um, lots of really you know interesting developments uh, with DoD that, that's happening here in northern Michigan, and the sanctuary has a has a really special uh, you know, connection to it, supporting it. Um, and, and also being involved uh, with CRTC officials uh, to a certain degree. Next slide, please. And the, the bottomlands of this range, of course, um, fall into largely deeper water, certainly deep enough where um, priorities for uh, commercial navigation um, have focused, of course, more inshore, more inland. Um, but it's it's definitely worth noting that you know a lot of the survey work that's been out here uh, represents some dated lead line and single beam surveys. Um, 96, 92, 96, 90, 9709, all you know late 70s single beam um, off the uh, NOAA ship uh, Mount Mitchell, and lead line before that really represents all of the sounding data that we have. Um, not just for navigating, not just for for, for mariners, um, but for survey planning um, in itself. So, um, you know, certainly uh, it's an interesting exercise trying to evaluate if we can work uh, together to to map more of this uh, overwater range, largely to um, evaluate presence or absence of uh, of cultural resources in an area. Um, of course, it's part of the sanctuary, so this is our operations that we're engaged in anyway. Um, but we've got this kind of extra layer in this case, which makes it makes it all the more interesting. Um, so priorities, of course, mapping the sanctuary and, and working with DoD um, with an area that's kind of co-managed with an extra layer on top. Next slide, please. And these efforts um, began sort of in a couple different ways. Um, and the range is a big place, right? And it also includes um, sort of the famed Six Fathom Bank Refuge, Six Fathom Bank Shoal, um, in the sort of the southern part of this area. Um, and of course, in 14, um, we were working with partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, to really characterize the Six Fathom Bank Refuge, which is, uh, you know, a lake floor feature characterized by shallow, rocky outcroppings in central Lake Huron. Um, and of course, was recognized in the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's 1998 Lake Trout uh, Re Rehabilitation Guide for Lake Huron. Um, so it obviously an area of interest um, for the sanctuary to be able to provide uh, more bathymetry data and partner work uh, collaboration potential with U.S. Fish and Wildlife for their needs. Um, but this was also right at the same time that the sanctuary expanded and expanded into the range, which of course included Six Island Bank. Um, and so really timely for work uh, to head out um, into this uh, sort of southern part uh, of the range. Um, in in 15, 2015, funding from um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative made this possible um, as collaboration uh, that resulted in bottom mapping of you know 13 square miles um, of lake floor within Six Fathom Bank. Um, the project resulted in the generation of you know bathymetry, bottom classification data products, GIS layers. Uh, bathymetry, uh, attributed grid files, you know, drop camera data, and a fully archived acoustic survey file directory. Um, and of course, notably, you know, this, like most things in the sanctuary, proudly, um, uh, couldn't it be done without uh, without partner support? Specifically, uh, Coast Survey was able to opportunistically make available a significantly improved multi-beam sonar system to augment um, the instrumentation installed on RV Storm. Uh, used during uh, previous field campaigns. So the project really demonstrated the value um, of federal partnerships to accomplish research, resource protection, and management goals um, that would really be quite difficult for us to do on our own in this new expanded area in the R4207 overwater range with Fish and Wildlife Coast Survey with their backs, uh, exploring new parts of the sanctuary. Next slide, please. Um, a quick uh, screen grab from the report. Um, this, this was a, a complete data set that included uh, included uh, some camera drop work, um, you know, after uh, bathymetry and backscatter were processed. So you see some geospatial arrangements of where that uh, substrate data and ground validation data was taken. Um, so uh, really a great way for us uh, in the sanctuary. This was uh, 
early on, you know, in our sort of investment um, and an eye towards uh, supporting and including uh, benthic habitat mapping during our um, specifically multi-beam data collection operations. Next slide, please. Six Fathom Bank um, is 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 a special area, and it's it's nearby, and, and sort of includes encompasses um, part of the Alpena Amberley Ridge, uh, which is its own incredible process. You guys are going to hear from Dr. Ashley Lemke tomorrow, so I don't want to steal too much um, of her of her thunder. Um, but I've got to give them a shout out to the incredible work that they're doing out there. Um, because it's worth noting, it's hard to talk about the range without including something about the Alpena Amberley Ridge. Um, and these paleo landscape studies have been going on in this place um, for uh, over a decade now, um, with of course partners uh, leading the charge from University of Michigan, um, University of Texas, Arlington, leading the charge for over a decade now. Next slide, please. Kind of moving, uh, moving on, right through through data collection and and how how was, um, you know processual efforts in the range have kind of guided sanctuary remote sensing management strategies priorities equipment acquisitions. Um, 2016, we welcomed uh, Tyan Fox from Office of Coast Survey um, to help with several survey initiatives in Thunder Bay. Um, the biggest of this effort was. Um, H12964, this is an area of interest identified by uh, OCS north of Thunder Bay Island. You can kind of see that uh, just in the middle of that map um, with uh, some of the side scan lines um, sort of blurred in gray. Um, you know, RV Storm was used uh, naturally um, with our partners from uh, NOAA Glural as a vessel of opportunity as it was based out of Alpena and still is. Um, and we used kind of what we had. Um, which uh, was uh, really an experience, um, both good and uh, good and challenging. Um, the Resan CBAT, CBAT 8101. So we installed the CBAT um, integrated storm with that equipment in a, in a V4 um, pause uh, and, and got to work. While Tyan was here and after we completed um, this area just north of Thunder Bay Island, um, we were uh, really excited to, to have Tyan stay for a few extra days help us with um, you know, capacity building within the sanctuary field team, uh, and also start to work towards um, covering some bottomlands that DOD had identified as places where they generally go for sur air to surface um, uh, sortie missions that they fly during these trainings. Um, so we completed several days of 24 hour operations uh, in this area that you see um, with the mosaic on the right and the big chunk in the kind of the middle north of the range. Um, it was prioritized by DOD. They wanted to map more in this in this area to enhance mission readiness for upcoming trainings, of course. Um, and a, another great example of, of readying RV Storm as a vessel of opportunity to meet partner needs. In this case, OCS uh, for, for getting chart level uh, chart standard data, um, you know, out of the 8101, uh, which, you know, despite some sort of learning curves with some outer beam issues, um, we, uh, we we got it dialed in. I mean, it was uh, all a big credit to tie in an OCS for, for helping getting uh, RV Storm ready for this mission. Um, and, and it also ground truthed uh, the 8101 for deeper water multi-beam data acquisition in sanctuary waters. Um, and of course, the data, as I mentioned, it did meet survey technical specifications, but it became clear that after this survey, um, perhaps you know, Office of National Marine Sanctuaries could focus on a newer echo sounder um, for integration into storm, um, which kind of ushered in sort of a new, uh, you know, a, a new hardware era uh, for us, uh, specifically through a Kongsberg a EM2040C based on, you know, a lot of Coast Survey success with that system on launches in sort of similar depth ranges, 100 to 200 meter max. Um, and this acquisition, of course, further promotes RV Storm and other uh, Glural vessels um, in their capacities to attract inter and intra-agency partners wishing to uh, partner on survey work within sanctuary boundaries, right? That's a big part about what we do. Uh, in this case, OCS uh, doing a lot of great work for us um, and, and, and showing us kind of the way, uh, the way really into the range uh, with the first big data collection in partnership with DOD in 2016. Next slide, please. 
Um, after 2016, uh, the range was uh, was quiet uh, for a little bit. We identified an area um, that uh, DoD was um, you know was interested in um, until 2019, when we had uh, partners at Incos. They wanted to conduct habitat mapping operations on the western side of the range that has some uh, really interesting geographical overlap with the Alpena Amberley Ridge. Um, this was the first marine spatial ecology project that Hincos led in Thunder Bay. Um, they were especially interested in um, the wide ranging landscapes and substrate types in regions with noticeable depth changes. So the data that was collected here in 2019 was followed by a ground truthing operations executed by scientific diving and camera drops deployed by um, a small boat uh, in the days after the survey uh, and also some delayed um, you know ground truthing expeditions that happened uh, in the months past um, there was some great coverage here 51 square miles i'm um, using the 2040c right this is kind of ushering into some, some of the more modern days of uh, a, a, of storm multi beam mapping with that integrated 2040c um, so it, it really worked out well and and, and, and costs were uh, were great partners to work with and, and thankfully this wasn't the last that we'd see from them in the Great Lakes certainly and certainly not Thunder Bay. Next slide please. A couple snapshots um, from that data uh, thanks to uh, to Charlie Menza for tossing these my way. Um, really interesting features here right I mean there's there's certainly some um, you know underwater possible underwater banks to the left um, down river channel in the middle um, pockmark fields uh, to the right, right, consistent with a lot of the karst geological um, formations that we see uh, offshore Lake Huron. Um, in this case, um, you know, some, some, some smaller scale uh, depressions um, that certainly can balloon out into larger, almost sinkhole-like formations that appear in the data um, in, in nearby areas. So connecting the dots and really dialing in um, a lot of great data in this sort of small area, but certainly um, promoting uh, promoting science and understanding of the range. Next slide, please. And uh, it didn't stop there with NCOS. Um, and really, we have been just so grateful for this process to have happened. Um, the following year, NCOS led a prioritization effort with 24 sanctuary stakeholders. We had you know, a wide range of interested participants, and this included our partners at DOD. Um, the objective, of course, is to identify overlapping areas of interdisciplinary interest to frame future survey efforts, you know, both sanctuary-led, uh, grant-funded, partner-led, uh, et cetera. Where do folks think we should go? And I know a lot of folks on this call were involved in this, uh, and we can't thank you enough for your participation because we use this prioritization tool all the time. And what you're seeing on the map here is um, just a quick snapshot of, of, of Justifications under safety and navigation. So these are um, these are participants who voted to uh, encourage um, mapping efforts in certain areas under the justification of safety and navigation. Um, and what you see is um, is uh, is an interesting U-shaped box that's framed around existing coverage. You know and. Uh, what the prioritization tool you know, told us and invalidated, of course, was that um, you know expanding on one area where uh, the Department of Defense can operate um, is is certainly seems to be their uh, their idea. This is kind of where they're working, kind of away from the southern parts, just kind of focusing right there. So um, a lot of good data that, that we pulled out from that exercise. Uh, big thanks to NCOS for leading it. Um, next slide, please. And just the, uh, this is a sad slide. I really, <laughs> this is a sad slide, um, but it's good to include, right? Because um, just the next year, which was which was COVID, um, we applied the results, right? Of that partization the year before to this field season. The first field season we could apply it, 2020, go figure. Um, and, uh, you know, we take it seriously. Our objective was to survey the areas designated by Department of Defense, this horseshoe, U-shape. Um, and as, you know, we all have and continue to experience, you know, operational stressors in the right ways rooted in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this single day of survey was was a small victory, I'll be honest. Uh, mapping the sanctuary, of course, in all its forms uh, remains a, a primary objective of the sanctuary and, and shared areas of interest among partners is a win-win um, for all of us. So 
we're working on this. We're uh, actively um, hoping to complete this this U-shaped box um, with a variety of sensors, including the 2040C that's um, kind of really been operated uh, on RV Storm for the last few years. Um, so we're making progress. Uh, we're working on it. Um, next slide, please. But, you know, when, when we talk about numbers uh, in the spirit of like bed 2030, um, you know, here it's 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 easy as, as a marine protected area. Uh, it's almost easiest to, for me to consider the breakdown of the areas as it relates to kind of what we know in size and, you know, of the of, of the entire range. Um, you know, two sensors have been used for mapping operations in the range, really more or less one uh, exclusively multi beam, but we have done. Um, some side scan sonar work with a client 3000 towable unit but most of the most of the data you see in green is, is collected by the Reese on CBAT 8101 and the Kongsberg 2040C over several of those projects that are presented on a few a uh, few slides ago um, you know and, and DOD has expressed uh, interest in pursuing joint interest funding to help the sanctuary map the rest of the range um, to make sure their activities do not impact resources that are co-managed by the sanctuary in the state of Michigan and we've worked with DOD, you know, of course, since the sanctuary's beginnings, before expansion, um, and are looking forward to uh, to more collaborative efforts in the future. Um, these surveys are planned to be conducted as sanctuary initiatives. These are uh, led by Thunder Bay uh, field teams uh, and, and inferred uh, and in, uh, encouraged uh, and agreed upon by our partners. Um, but we're using in-house capacities at scales to be determined. Um, we're certainly uh, taking this in stride, uh, starting with uh, those single day of survey last year, um, starting strong, uh, but starting small and, and blossoming this out right to the future um, as needed by Department of Defense for, for their mission readiness needs and for our larger objective to map the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And of course, as, as more bottomlands get mapped, um, that data will further inform our interested stakeholders in this area of Lake Huron, including our larger participatory effort um, in Lake Bed 2030. So um, thank you very much. Next slide, please. We'll finish uh, finish here. I know I got maybe a minute for questions, but if uh, we don't get to those, um, give me an email and I do my best to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. We might get some um, dropped into the chat. Um, I had a question. Uh, well, first, it sounds like you had a lot of fun between 2015 and 2020 playing with um, the new Kongsberg, new equipment. <laughs> um, but I did wonder um, if that data, is it included in the Bathy Gap analysis now? Is it at NCAI yet? So, so some of it is, um, you know, and, and a lot of it is sort of still being processed by partners. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife data, for example, um, you know, is 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 a, is a service provided to them officially. Um, so some of it is, some of it isn't. We're working to get all of that incorporated into NCEI as sort of a batch upload through Cruise Back and in other methods. 